So in a month where United won all but one game, um, it looks as if the future of the coach is back up for discussion among the media, among pundits, among fans. And also, um, yesterday United played against Nottingham Forest and won the game by a goal to nil. It puts United's quest for another final in the FA Cup on course and but the loss has put United or has given United a major setback in their quest for top four football. This and many others that we'll be discussing today on United and Everything Football here on our YouTube channel. As always, I'm always here with Fabio Jubuesiako, always joining me and for us to discuss all the major issues here on our podcast. We are grateful to have you always here to join us on this beautiful podcast. As always, remember to hit the subscribe button. And also hit the notification bell. It's always, always, always important for us, please. If this is your first time, and if you're watching and you've not subscribed, please, this is the moment. Just pause the video and then subscribe for us. Uh, let's grow this community together so we can bring you a lot more content here on United and Everything Football Podcast. Kwame, um, after a major setback, um, United back to me in winning ways. How, how are you feeling about the whole situation? Uh, at United, every every defeat feels like a crisis. That's that's the thing. It's just one loss out of six games in a month. Our first defeat in two months, and all of a sudden, all the negative stories that you have been seeing in previous months just suddenly resurface. It's United. It's a it's a content creating machine. People need to feed, so people keep on. Writing, I, I get it. Um, the margin for error was always small. We knew that from the very start of the year yeah. that we needed to go on a championship run yeah. in order to keep our top four hopes alive. Any defeat was going to result in this kind of reaction where people, were, especially to a team that we expected to beat, especially at home, was going to result in this kind of reaction. But the team bounced back yesterday. They bounced back, they showed a lot of grits, and then they bounced back to keep our chances of also winning a trophy alive. So, yeah. Well, okay. Well, that's by way of introduction. We'll, we'll go for a break. When we come back, we'll just go into the issues, um, look at what happened in a game against Nottingham Forest. Probably go a little way back to look at the game against Fulham, where United lost by two goals to one in the nine members of the game and also we have a poll for you a poll that we organized on our x handle at my united ball we'll be presenting the poll to you and also we will be glad to have your comments within the, in the in the comment section always remember please leave a comment in the comment section let's talk with don't just watch leave a comment like and also share with your friends and also subscribe if you're not that we'll be back right after this Okay, so you are welcome back to United and Everything Football. It's always great to have you here with us on this channel. Kwame, so a lot has been happening from Saturday till now. Um, a lot of questions being asked about the coach, his tactics, his, away, his, his approach to football, how United have performed throughout the season. Like you rightly said, the margin of error has been very, very, very little. And as a result of that, the coach... Um, any major defeat or any setback? Any kind Great. of defeat, Kwame. Exactly. It doesn't have to be a major defeat now. Yes, any, any major... Yeah, yeah. Well, I call it a major defeat because of the opponent and the venue where this game has happened. But mm -hmm. let's 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 get into it. What is really happening? What, in, in your opinion, over between Saturday and the game against Forest, what has happened? And what is happening to Eric Ten Hag and his way of doing things? Nothing's happened. 
We just lost one game. Uh, see, one I, game. Personally, I, I think it's just, I think it's an overreaction to events. Kwame, we've been here several times over the past 11 years, me and me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when we did, people wouldn't know this, but then I shed a bit of light. When we did form our WhatsApp group um, about three or four years ago in the midst of COVID, do you remember the uproar when something uh, stole a point at the meltdown that night? Yes, do you remember? Yes, 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 yes. It's not so dissimilar to the, what we find ourselves right now. We were in a period where we needed to win game after game after game in order to get a top four spot under all and associate. There was very little room for error. And that night, when we do, when we lost those late points, it felt as if the world had come to an end. We crucified everybody from the playing staff to the coaching staff to even our, ourselves as fans. It was, it was terrible. I felt that's exactly what happened after Fulham. It was a terrible performance. It was, it was, they were the better team. We did not deserve anything from the game. I think when we did pull um, level, we should have managed the game better and probably even taken away a point rather than go gang go looking for the win. I guess it's at home, it's at Old Trafford. You always have to be on the front foot. But I don't think that game was managed properly. What you're seeing is a team that's scrambling for results. It's a team that isn't playing a particular brand of football that fans expect right now. But then it's trying to get over the line. The reason why I say this is I have gone through a spectrum of emotions over the course of the season. And I've shared different opinions and thoughts at different stages of the season. At the start of the season, when all these injuries and everything was, was mounting up, I said to myself, I don't care about the performances, if you can remember yeah. from the start of the season. Mm -hmm. All I cared was about was the results. The reason was that you come to a sense of realization that the tactics that this coach is trying to deploy, but the players that he has at his disposal, even at full strength, yeah. we are very limited in terms of the kind of players who can actually play the type of football that he wants. Absolutely. We can talk about his recruitment. We can talk about the players that were already there. It is clear. Unless, of course, you do not want to accept it. People will say, but our squad is better than the likes of Aston Villa. Our squad is better than this and that. You may talk about individual players being better. For instance, let's take centre-backs. Lindelof and Maguire. They may be better than Paul Torres and Konza. But are they good for the kind of football that Unai Emery wants to play? Can Lindelof and Maguire play a high line every day for Aston Villa? Konza has the pace. He can actually recover. Can Maguire recover the way that Konza does? Maguire may be a better player than Konza, but he may not necessarily fit the way that Aston Villa wants to play. Eric Ten Hag wants to play in a particular way this season, which requires our centre-backs, our defenders, pushing up high, being very good one-on-one -on -one in one-on-one -on -one, um, situations whilst defending, being able to track back when the ball is played in behind. But can our defenders play that way? You don't need any more evidence throughout the course of the season to suggest that they cannot. They are caught in half-and-half -half situations. They don't press as the forward line or the midfield presses, leaving huge gaps in the middle of the park that teams play around and teams exploit. You can ask somebody, a horse, to go to the river, but you can't force the river. You can't force the horse to actually drink from the river. That's what is happening right now. Eric and Hart can tell these boys, push up all you want. But if the player's natural instinct tells him that if I'm going to push up, I'm going to be in trouble, and that the best form that I can actually do right now is to stay back and try and shadow the, the, the center forward that I have, he can try for you in certain moments, in certain games, to do it. But over a course of a period, 90 minutes, over a course of games, he will not deliver that for you. But what this coach is doing is being stubborn in his principle, as we discussed many months ago, that he was always going to choose between one thing, either to adapt to the strength of this players and abandon his style of football completely, or treat this as a process where he would continue to try and implement his ideas on the team, irrespective of the flaws of certain players, hoping that with time, he can 
quickly. It's almost like you plug and play. You take phase out these players and bring in the players that you want without necessarily changing the principles. That's what he's trying to do. And whilst doing that, we are going to have as many iffy results as you are seeing now. You see us play basketball week in, week out. You see the lineup and you know there are certain players who will not help us exert control in football games. But does the coach have a choice? If he's not going to play McTominay, who is he going to play? If he's not going to play Lindelof, who is he going to play? If he's not going to play Maguire, he has to play Johnny Evans. If he's not going to play somebody, a, a misfit at left back, since we don't have any left back, we have only one fit full, full back at a football club right now. You don't have able alternatives. Every single player that he can bring in now is a misfit for the system that he wants to play. Yet he has to play it. Sorry, yet he wants to play it. Yeah. Your bone of contention may be, does he have to? But he's looking at long-term benefits over short-term benefits. If he's able, some way, somehow, to pull off a top four spot while still playing that this way and get more time from the owners, get a transfer window with this, the whole system, whatever process that is going through, he himself, the club, the fans, will all be better off for it. Case in point, it's Mikel Ateta at Arsenal. I've said this on this spot several times. Sometimes you just have to brave through a system in a period, take whatever hits that come with it. And at the end of it, at the end of the tunnel, that's where you see the actual lights. That's where you actually see where all this is going to. He may have bought himself time last season with how he performed and winning a trophy and everything. What makes this his future a bit uncertain is the fact that new ownership comes in, new ambition, new ideas. They will have their own man lined up. And if results aren't going your way, it is quite easy for them to say, we are getting rid of you because you haven't gotten the results that you want. And then as me and you sit here right now, we are not certain as to what Emir's decision on Henry Ten Hag may be. In terms of the result, I feel like we should all calm down a little bit. It's one defeat in 2024. It's not the end of the world. The window of opportunity has become slimmer. It doesn't mean it has closed. I, I still go back to Oligon Associates' first season, full season at Manchester United, COVID period, project lockdown. We were in the same exact situation. Eric Ten Hag has 12 games in the league. Now we have to win at least eight of those games. We have City coming up next. We have the likes of Everton. We have uh, mm -hmm. big games coming up. Yeah. But as the tax at hand, it would be much, much easier if he had the full complement of his squad to be able to take on this challenge. But it is what it is. Being what it is, fans should temper their expectations a little bit. Demanding a style of play at this particular point in time, this juncture, doesn't even make sense. It doesn't. I've been big on our top four hopes, you know that, for a yeah. long time. The very day I heard that Hoyland was injured, what did I say in our WhatsApp? Mm -hmm. Listen mm -hmm. to you that. Come on. I mean, you finally get your striker who can actually get you over the line with some goals and some results, scoring goals. And the next thing you know, he also goes down injured. That spells trouble right away before the Fulham game. I'm not putting in excuses for him, but then let's just be logical and reasonable here. If your other forwards aren't scoring, and then you get your main centre forward actually scoring, at last, and all of a sudden he has to pull out, and you don't have an alternative centre forward. That's just a bit hard on the coach, a bit hard on the team, a bit hard on us, and culminated in what you saw over the weekend. Mm -hmm. But some way, somehow, we put ourselves together again. You can't say this team is not playing for the manager. That's one thing no one can actually yeah. confidently say. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they will not play the way that they played yesterday. Yeah. But can they play the way that the manager actually envisages that they should play? These players, they don't have the facilities to do it. You'll be lying to yourself if you think that most of them can play that way. They don't. So, let's grind. Keep on grinding grinding to the end of the season, and let's just see whether we can obtain our objectives and then see what the summer offers.
Well, what do you think will be going into the minds of the owners or the news, the new management or the new owners? What does that be taking charge of the football direction of of the team right now? Um, they've made it very clear that for FPF, FFP purposes, they want the club to make Champions League. Um, and there's a manager who is also sticking his guns to playing by his way or no other way, uh, which has also proven over time that it gives or it's given him inconsistent results at the end of the day. So what do you think the owners would be thinking? Should we give him time? Do, should we lower our expectations and think that, oh, let's take the hits for this 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 season and see how things will go? Or let's just hammer on the fact that we need Champions League football and the coach has to deliver or he sends out. What do you think will be going into the minds of the owners now? Let me try and paraphrase or quote exactly what Jimmy Radcliffe said. He said, we have long-term goals and then we have immediate problems that we have to attend to. The immediate problem has to do with the fact that United needs Champions League football. Yeah. The reason why we need Champions League football is these people want to go at the transfer window full throttle. Yeah. They don't want to be limited in terms of financial fair play mm-hmm. when they want to go into the transfer market. It doesn't necessarily mean that they still cannot find alternative ways mm-hmm. of still going around FFP, as we discussed similarly with the, the, the need to sell certain players, especially homegrown players, mm-hmm. to make more room in the transfer market. Manchester United, historically, over the past 11 years, whenever we don't even qualify for the Champions League, that is when we even spend how much and lot more to try and get back into it. The problem is we never ever follow up with windows that would complement our position in terms of not struggling again to qualify for the top four the following season. That's exactly what happened to Eric and Lag, where we had a sub power window and we didn't kick on from the first season that he had. So that is, that is just for clarity's sake. The best thing that happened to Ineos, as I always say, is what happened to them at Nice. Yeah. That Nice experience, they will bring it into Manchester United. A lot of fans are expecting them to go gang with their decisions, mm-hmm. bear out everybody, start a whole new process. No, that's exactly the mistakes that they actually made at Nice, where they went in, cleared out everything, and had to make several mistakes in order to make corrections. What they will try and do with Eric Ten Hag is understand what has happened in his regime so far. What the process that he is studying is when they understand it and they buy into it, I don't think there will be a knee-jerk reaction to sack the manager. Serge Miraclef has made it abundantly clear to us all that we've had very good managers over the past 11 years. But some of them have, in fact, all of them have struggled to be successful at Manchester United because at Manchester United, success is defined by winning the Champions League and competing for league titles. All those other trophies are just to make up for last time. But United have struggled to compete for the league title. We've not actually competed for 11 years. Yeah. We've barely even qualified for the Champions League. We qualified five out of the last 10 seasons. So we are just up and down. Mm-hmm. So it tells you that the environment around the manager is often the problem rather than the manager himself. Yeah. All you've been hearing is changes that these people are trying to make in and around the manager to surround him with the right people. When you listen to Ayrton Hag himself, he continues to say, I've had several conversations with these people and we are on the same page. I could do with the help that Ineos are looking to offer. I am of the conviction after everything, I do a lot of, I analyze a lot. Not just necessarily because of the fact that I like Eric Ten Hag as a manager, because that's how the tangent that some people may go with. But I do believe, I have a very strong conviction that Indians are not just going to rip everything apart. Mm -hmm. What they are going to do is 
based off the manager's contract himself. You know the contract situation. He has one year left plus and plus one. They're in a comfortable situation. They don't have to do anything new to check with Eric Turner. They don't have to pay an insane compensation even to get rid of him, if they want to get rid of him. I think he deserves at least three years and a half. Next season would be his third season. If Ineos keep him, which I expect them to do, that's my conviction, I expect them to keep him for at least one more season and try and help him to complete his process. Once they do that, by replacing a lot of the players who should be replaced, because that backline that we have currently cannot play the kind of football that Eric wants, cannot play the type of football that even Sergio Miraclef has said that he wants. Clearly, we want to play like City. Maguire at 30, Lindelof at almost 30, Varane at 31, 32 years, Johnny Evans at 35 years old, cannot play the kind of football that City play. All those defenders must go. We must look at our full-back situation all over again. Once I believe that you get Eric and have these materials, as well as an alternate centre forward, who can actually stay on the football pitch and play, unlike Martial, I believe this manager can take on and complete the process that he speaks of. It will be very easy after one year with Eric Ten Hag and the players that Ineos will assemble for him. That if he doesn't pull it off, then they will get rid of him and bring in a new manager. This is exactly how I envisage the situation to be and none of that. Well, as it stands, there's still not guarantee or there's no guarantee that Eric Ten Hag stays at the end of the season or by the end of the season and um Serge Miracle as you rightly said has spoke about the environment but one thing he also did was not to guarantee the future of the coach as a result of that has thrown a lot of names out there you've seen a lot of names out there um people like Julian Nagelsmann um Inzaghi of Inter Milan um uh, what's his name? Ruben Amorim. Uh, what, what other names? Roberto Di Zerbi. All of these names have come up. So we put up a poll on our United handle on um, X called the Man United Ball, where we sought your opinion on what you think about who should be the next coach of United should, in case um, Ineos decides to dispense Eric Ten Hag. And this is the result that you people, based on the, the, the poll, decided. Many of the people, are about 51%, feel that Simeone Inzaghi, one of the most brilliant coaches in Europe now, what he's doing with Inter, should be the coach that should take over. The others went for, 37% of you went for Julian Nagelsmann, and then 7% for Roberto Di Zerbi, and then 5% for Ruben Amorim. So Kwame... These are, this is the poll, and this is what people are saying. But I would ask you, should in case Eric Ten Hag should never, should, should, should leave posts or Ineos should decide that, hey, Eric, thank you for your service. We don't need you anymore. We need a new direction. Which of these coaches would you opt for? I'd have to say a few things before I, I even delve into that. But I, I, I'm going directly to you. Which of the coaches are you going to be? I've not actually sat down to think about a replacement for Eric Ten Hag. And of the names that you've, you've mentioned, the only one that fits, it's one you don't actually like, which is Roberto Di mm -hmm. The reason why I say this is that you have to look at the football that Ineos wants to play, the kind of CEO that they are bringing in, mm -hmm. the kind of sporting director that they are bringing in. And the only one on that list for me who has who has shown, especially in the Premier League, because that's very important to me, yeah. that can play that type of football. It's actually a better deserve of Brighton. But I don't think he has the CV or the portfolio to manage Manchester United. I don't think so. Amorim is the second closest. Nagos man is more like he comes from the, the Ragnick school of thought for me. And that's not the kind of football that I think I think Ineos wants to see. Simeone is the worst fit in terms of the kind of football that Ineos wants to actually play. But then fans are voting for him mainly because, you know, that's how football fans we are. He's the winning coach now. He's the coach who is coaching 
probably the second or third best team in Europe right now. Inter have shown a lot of consistency. Yeah. But the player system mm -hmm. and the style of football, that is nothing close to what Manchester United or Ineos would want to see. So, yeah, deserve it. But then, honestly, I'm, I'm not a deserving guy. So none of them. I've not even began to think about a replacement for Eric Tenag. Anyway. None of these coaches actually would make any serious changes to Manchester United if the environment around the club remains the same. They will come and it will be the same graveyard that it has been for all the other great managers who have been appointed over the past 11 years. So change the environment before you even start to think about changing the coach. That's where I am. Well, so the environment has to change. And Sergio Miracliffe is actually ensuring that by getting in the best of best in class. I mean, the sporting director got in Omar Barada from Manchester City as a new CEO to help bring that balance between business and football. Dan Ashworth is also being negotiated for. The negotiation between United and Newcastle is still ongoing. And also Jason Wilcox of Southampton, who is a sporting director, is also in the frame. A lot of names have come up for the recruitment. Who, who will be the head of recruitment? Because I hear it's a position that Ineos is also looking at to help revamp the whole football operations within the club. So a lot of names have been coming up. Um, Dogman Friedman from um, Crystal Palace has come up. Uh, we heard of Julian Ward, but we are hearing he might be taking up a very higher position within the Ineos rank and all of that. So, the news will be breaking or will be coming up in the course of uh, in the course of in due time. So, we'll be bringing you everything here on this channel. So, please always remember to stick and stay with us. It's very, very important to us. So, let's wrap it up with a game against City over the weekend. Manchester United versus Manchester City. Um, Last time we met out there, it was a very, very, very bad scoreline for United. It was around 6-3. Ellen Haaland and I think Phil Fooding getting um, hat-tricks in that game. And United some way, somehow got three goals. I don't know what happened. But Kwame, against City, um, not so flamboyant as you'd expect. But not too long ago, they put six pass. Luton Town in the FA Cup game that they played. Um, the last league game they played at home was against Brentford. They struggled, but they got a 1-0 win. Prior to that, they played against Chelsea and drew 1-1 in that game. But it's a huge game between United and Manchester City. We don't have that same only feeling we had anytime we were going to the Etihad where we felt we could get something out of it. Just go and then they knew the exact type of football we would play, but they just couldn't stop us. But looking at the state of the club right now, the state of our, the injury situation within the club and everything, do you still think United have a chance going into this game? I don't think United have a chance, but do you think United have a chance? I think 90% of Manchester United fans think United don't have a chance. United don't have a chance. The, the, it's, it's a very simple reason. If, if you drew up uh, our fixtures at the start of 2024 and then you have to take which games that you think that United should definitely win in order for us to get top four. You skip quickly over the City fixture because you yeah. know we're not getting anything from that game. So let's not just come and sit here and then pretend as if we should expect a miracle over the weekend. Of course. That's, that's, that's not going to happen. <laughs> that's, the, it's, the best you can hope for is a performance like the one you saw at Liverpool. Yeah, And I think one selection would... I'm going to say this. One, one selection would force us to play exactly that same way. Bruno Fernandes is hoppling. He's not fit. Yeah. He is carrying a major injury, as yeah. Elton Hag told us. Mm -hmm. I think with or without Fernandes, we are unlikely to win that football game. Mm -hmm. It will be best if we actually rest him from that football game so that this team does plays in a certain way. When certain players are in play, the team plays in a certain way. When certain players are playing, they are also forced to play in one particular way. But you know that is not you know that is not happening. Bruno Fernandez will definitely play. It's possible. It's possible he might not be fit to play. I I just feel it's possible he might not be fit to play. And if he's not hundred percent fit, you have to take a a calculated gamble mm -hmm. and rather reserve him for future games, winnable games. I'll set Bruno Fernandes and go with probably a pairing of 
uh, Mainu and Casemiro in the center of the pack with Scott McTominay, of course, ahead of them. Yeah. That forces us to be a bit more defensive and a bit more compact in midfield. Yeah. That's what I would do. Mm-hmm. That may get us a point at the Etihad. Yeah. Although that's uh, although I'd also confess it's highly unlikely. Yeah. Let's not put any hopes or expectations over the weekend. The, the big goof was the one against Fulham. We should have yeah. won that one. Probably lost this one and we'll move on to the other fixtures, subsequent fixtures. But here's the case where it's likely we are going to suffer back to back defeats in the league, and now we'll be seen as a major setback leading up to the rest of the games of the season. So that's just where we are. I don't expect much for that game. Whatever happens, we take it for the championship. Well, not a lot to be expected from that game, but hey, this is United. Anything at all can happen. We all felt we we're going to get hammered in a games in a game against Liverpool at Anfield, but we went there, we surprised them. But we had the best chances in the game. So everything will depend on the game plan of the coach and not leaving all those gapping holes in midfield for the City team to run. Definitely, we are not going to attack City. Definitely. I'm sure it's going to be similar to the game plan that Chelsea used against City, where we would have to sit back and find our way through counter-attacks. Or, you know, of course, City are going to push up and then leave a lot of spaces in behind yes. where you'd expect the likes of Marcos Rashford and Co to you know run into and make who are the co? Cool? Mention the co. Cool. Oh, of course, cool. Alejandro Ganacho. Those are the people and, who are definitely going to exploit. And, yes, and I mean those are the two players who run in behind. And who? Those are the two players. That's the problem. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Rashford is out of form. We can't replace Rashford. Ganacho is not playing well. We cannot replace Ganacho. Yeah. You know, Fernandez is out of sorts. We yes. don't have anybody to replace him. So that is what's it. happening with Grealish yeah. at City. Mm-hmm. Completely out of form, out of sorts. Yeah. But guess what? They it's have quality. capable, able, that, quality that's... to replace him. Uh, Doku is playing like crap after just one good game all season. Yeah. But then nobody cares because they have quality <laughs> players to replace him. Of course, of when course. Those are, those, are, those, are the, those are the, I mean, conversations that come exactly. up. Exactly. Our squad is simply not that's, good enough. There's a lot. There's, there's, ob- obviously, obviously. Obviously. So that's it. We would... We still have to find a way to, you know, uh, exploit those spaces, regardless. I mean, Chelsea went there with Jackson and Sterling to exploit spaces. So, what shows that Rashford and Garnacho can't? We just have to get our game plan so spot on uh, and see how best we can get the best out of it. So, that's it. That's how we wrap up for today on United and Everything Football. We'll be back after the City game to give you a lot more. Uh, we hope that is a better result for us. That doesn't widen our chance or that doesn't close the window to our chance of making top four because Aston Villa will be playing against Tottenham for first two and those are our major contenders for top four. So, it's great having you. As always, remember to hit the subscribe button and also hit the notification bell. Thank you so much for joining us and it's great having you on this channel. Thank you very much, Kwame, and thank you for watching United and Everything Football. Have a great time.